Hello, this is Edward Polachek coming to you once again uh, to get you a little bit acquainted with our upcoming concert on March 26th. It's going to be at the Friedberg Hall at Peabody Conservatory of Music, 8 p.m., and we're celebrating one composer. Um, this seems to be the year for our one composer uh, concerts. We opened with uh, Al Schumann on March 26th. We're going to be celebrating none other than the great Ludwig von Beethoven. Um, and it's an unusual program. It's a blockbuster program. Two of his greatest works um, that uh, are probably perhaps two of his most popular. The Great Emperor Piano Concerto, Concerto Number no. 5, uh, with our soloist Clinton Adams on the first half, and on the second half, the Great Symphony Number no. 9, the Choral Symphony. I like these kinds of programs for a number of reasons. Uh, not the least of which is that when you look at it, the Emperor Piano Concerto is the last piano concerto that he wrote, and the Symphony Number no. 9 is also the last symphony that he wrote. Um, they, on paper, they come from two different periods. We've uh, traditionally uh, blocked out Beethoven's life in three different periods, the, the early, the middle, and the late period. <coughs> Um, and the piano concerto is, falls squarely in the middle period of, of Beethoven. Uh, the symphony number no. nine is a different kind of story. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. I want to focus back on, on the piano concerto for just a second. Um, we, we talk about the periods in music. Um, and we, we, we throw these terms around. Medieval period, the Renaissance, the Baroque, classical, romantic. Uh, post-romantic, the 20th century, we have all these various labels and uh, they become a little bit uh, uh, clouded uh, it, with, with certain delineations that we have to apply. Um, Beethoven is a, is a wonderful topic to talk about in terms of periods because uh, he's very much a classical composer um, and yet many would argue he's definitely a romantic composer. Um, there are several composers who kind of fall into that, that, that category. Uh, he was sort, certainly born during the time period and, and spent most of his life during what we consider as the classical period. Uh, and roughly, just and this is very rough, roughly it's about a hundred years from the death of Bach in 1750 through where the, we know as the Romantic composers, 1850. Uh, when, with the emergence of, of composers like um, Mendelssohn, Brahms, Schumann, Chopin, Liszt, Wagner, Mahler, uh, going going into that that period, and as we see those as being very very romantic, um, Beethoven might be considered the most um, rebellious or uh, uh, maybe the, the greatest renegade uh, who really broke out of the classical traditions and really thrust the door open to the Romantic period. Uh, but as I said, he was still firmly locked into or, or a, a very strong part of the classical period. So his earlier works, his earlier symphonies, the first and second uh, symphony, his early piano concertos, piano sonatas, chamber music, um, emulate a lot of what the kind of music that um, uh, Mozart and Haydn were writing, and in fact, uh, Haydn was one of his heroes. Um, but as uh, time progressed, Beethoven couldn't help but just break out of that, that mold. He couldn't be confined into just the classical period. And I would suggest that the Emperor Piano Concerto is a great um, example of a very classical structure and even somewhat sounding a uh, piece of music f firmly embedded in the classical period and yet has a lot of romantic um, uh, tendencies. Um, not the least of which is the way it opens, which is with one huge orchestra chord and immediately the piano goes into a cadenza, an, a, a very kind of rhapsodic moment of, of bravura uh, arpeggios and scales and trills and everything else. People were, were stunned by this. This was so unusual to have it, have it happen. And after he does this three times, on three chords and three 
the cadenzas right in the opening. Then he breaks into the old classical style, very long orchestral introduction, and then rather standard uh, uh, movement, uh, first movement of a piano concerto. Um, another thing that's somewhat romantic about the uh, piano concerto is the going from the second movement directly, without pause, into the third movement. Uh, and he does this by a very um, uh, stark or jarring shift. He's in the key of B major, which I understand is the only piece of music that Beethoven ever wrote in the key of B major, the second movement. And he just kind of shifts the whole tonality down a half step so he can get closer to B flat major, and that gives us the dominant of the, of the last movement, uh, the key of the, of the piano concerto. Um, and so that is, that is kind of a romantic tendency. The last movement's a rondo. You hear the theme over and over again, and it's really quite stunning. Although this particular rondo, he has as, also as a variation set and um, a, a very uh, standard form, but very brilliant, very technical, uh, very virtuosic writing. You have to understand that Beethoven was a pianist, and he was probably considered the greatest pianist of his day. He took the mantle of a Bach through the Mozart keyboard people into the classical uh, and romantic era uh, in such a way that composers that followed, like Liszt, like Chopin, had to emulate the kinds of writing that Beethoven did for the piano. That's our first half of the program. On our second half, uh, I don't think there's a soul alive that doesn't know um, some of the themes from the Ninth Symphony. Um, years ago, uh, there was a news program, Huntley Brinkley, and they used um, the one and only rec recording of the Beethoven Ninth that Toscanini actually allowed to be recorded. They used the second movement of that uh, uh, performance of Toscanini's as their theme. Um, we hear it again and again, that same kind of, kind of theme, um, in various uh, film scores, uh, also, I think I'm um, one of the MSNBC, uh, and I want to say it was the the older Keith Olbermann um, uh, news news program. I think also used <laughs> that scherzo, the second movement. Um, but there are several things about uh, the symphony that make it a romantic symphony, and there are many things about it that also keep it in the classical style. Um, first of all, uh, the form itself. Um, four movements um, and the structure as a sonata form in the first movement. Um, we have a scherzo movement, we have a slow movement, and we have a last movement. Um, the four, four somewhat standard uh, uh, symphonic movements are all there as they were in the classical period. However, it was, in, it was generally the tradition to follow the first movement, which is a more fast, uh, uh, upbeat type of movement with the slow movement. And here's where Beethoven broke uh, his, uh, or broke the tradition. He put the scherzo movement as the fast, uh, the, fa the second movement as a fast movement rather than a slow movement, followed by a slow movement. Um, and I should mention that if you really want to get into this, this particular scherzo, this second movement, is not just your traditional scherzo. And I have to tell you that I do it exactly the way Beethoven had done it, both from a, a metronome point of view, metronomic point of view, the tempo, and all of the repeats. Um, I think because I think the structure is very important. A lot of people cut out it because it tends to be a long symphony. Um, but my tempi are on the brighter side, so it won't be actually as long. It'll actually be on the shorter side. Um, but what's amazing about this particular scherzo is that it's not just a scherzo; it's also a sonata movement, and it's brilliantly, brilliantly constructed. Um, we all know, of course, that the last movement is where he brought in the voice. He brought in a vocal uh, quartet, solo quartet, and he used a four-voice uh, mixed chorus as well. Uh, and this was a totally new concept. Um, what is amazing about this is the last movement, the fourth movement, the choral movement that we all know and love, is actually a symphony in itself. So it's not just the fourth movement, but it's actually, if, if, you, if you, when you listen to it, 
it starts out with the fast section, then it goes to a slow section, and then it goes to a, uh, excuse me, he does it in reverse, it goes to the fast section, then he goes to the scherzo section, then he goes to a slow movement, and then he ends with a big finale. So, uh, although it's the last movement, and it's the longest single movement up, ever composed for a symphony up to this point, um, it is uh, the fourth movement, but it's also a symphony in itself, and it is spectacular. That's a romantic aspect of the symphony. Um, now, keeping that in mind, I'd like to go back to what I had said earlier about the, the three periods of Beethoven, the early, the middle, and the late. And uh, the piano concerto, as I said, was, was written squarely in the middle period. The Ninth Symphony is actually written in the late period. But most of the sketches, believe it or not, are from the early and middle period. The only movement that does not exhibit that, that is a true late period aspect of the symphony, is the third movement, the slow movement, which is a beautiful variation set. Um, so it's a little bit of a conundrum, um, and yet um, one of the most spectacular symphonies at that point that had ever been composed, and when you think about it, it's one of the most spectacular symphonies that's ever been composed. Now, we know that symphonies later on in the Romantic period, like those of Mahler, for example, did utilize a cho chorus and, and brought it in. But, of course, it was already done uh, by Beethoven at, at this point. Um, so he really did set the standard with his feet firmly impl implanted within the Classical period. He also straddled into the Romantic period and created brand new, um, kept on raising the bar in terms of uh, uh, innovations within music um, that were difficult, if not impossible, to top. Uh, but he certainly gave then the platform for all those composers uh, who followed to be able to build on what, what Beethoven had done. It's an amazing, amazing program, and I hope it's a program that you will not miss. We want you to be there with us. I'm extremely excited about it. Uh, I mentioned Clinton Adams as our soloist with the Emperor. We have a beautiful vocal quartet <coughs> with, for the Beethoven Ninth. Uh, we have Janice Chandler Etime as our soprano, Melissa Kornacki as our mezzo, William Davenport as our tenor, and Robert Cantrell as our bass. Um, and we have our uh, symphonic chorale, concert art symphonic chorale, joining our concert artist orchestra for what I'm hoping will be one of the great, and I'm looking forward to it as, one of the great musical highlights of the 10-11 season. So I leave you with one question. Who was Beethoven's favorite composer? See you on the 26th. Thank you.